Welcome historians. How are, how's everyone doing? Today we're going to be going over America's Gilded Age. Uh, last time we were covering the um, uh, topic of manifest destiny and pushing westward. And today we will be covering uh, the Gilded Age, um, how the American industrial might and system uh, was created, expanded, trudged on, and how various uh, individuals were able to amass an enormous amount of wealth, um, how they were able to um, build their businesses and eventually um, grow them to such an extent that they became almost unstoppable and they became monopolies and trusts and so on. Uh, I love showing this initial uh, poster, right? This uh, clip, this uh, magazine, uh, you know, uh, artistic rendition, because it shows the uh, the you know hall of the Senate, right, within the U.S. Congress, uh, and you see all of our legislatures there, right, uh, kind of toiling away. However, in the back, as the kind of overwatchers and guardians of uh, the American democratic process, you see all of these uh, individuals from steel, uh, copper, standard oil, sugar, coal, salt, all of these large industries. And these men are being portrayed as large sacks of money. And so this you know, theme of greed, this theme of... Uh, you know, money involved in politics, right, and corruption is ripe. And so I love this uh, imagery here. And if you notice on the top left hand side, um, all the way on the second floor, it says the people's entrance, and it is closed and it is barred, uh, and has a big lock on it. And so it is very symbolic that the people are not allowed in the democratic, uh, you know, progressions, right, in Congress. However, all of these money interests are. Uh, so it is a very uh, interesting visual cue of what goes on in American politics. Now, some questions to consider for today. Number one, how did the new industrial order represent both new opportunities and new limitations for rural and working class urban Americans? Number two, how did the emergent consumer culture change what it meant to be American at the turn of the century? Uh, during this point in time, many of you know the industries were being born, they were created, they were expanding, and Americans found themselves, you know, uh, with almost limitless amounts of opportunities to purchase different goods. Um, and so, what once was a very expensive and limited object now has become more freely available for the public. And so consumer culture has now been uh, created and something that we obviously still see today. Uh, and number three, consider the fact that the light bulb and the telephone were invented only three years apart. Although it took many more years for such devices to find their way into common household use, they eventually brought major changes in a relatively brief period of time. What effects did these inventions have on the lives of those who use them? Are there contemporary analogies in your lifetime of significant changes due to inventions or technological innovations? So, obviously, if we are discussing the light bulb slash electricity and the telephone, they are going to have widespread reach and enormous influence onto society technologically. And I love to pose the question to my classes, in your own life, right, in today, are there any inventions that have fundamentally changed your uh, perspective in the world and your uh, life in general? Uh, and we'll discuss some of them, but on the very kind of very simplistic basis now that I'm looking on, you know, my desk, right? all of this tech that we have here, cell phones, right? Um, all of these different inventions that uh, make our life uh, a little bit, you know, easier, but definitely more complex in a, in a number of other ways. Um, 10 points for whoever can uh, guess these individuals names. Uh, 
So here represented and seated, we have uh, Mr. Vanderbilt on the left-hand side. Uh, we have Andrew Carnegie, we have JP Morgan, and last but not least, we have Henry Ford. So these gentlemen represent just some of the uh, what are going to be called and termed the robber barons of the day and age. Um, these larger than life uh, figures that were so wealthy and built up their businesses to such an extraordinary degree that they were almost uh, like living gods amongst men uh, in terms of financial wealth. So essentially, in today's, uh, in today's contemporary analogies, they will be the Bill Gates and the Jeff Bezoses um, or the Elon Musks of, uh, let's say, the uh, Gilded Age. And so Mr. Vanderbilt on the left-hand side was famous for his uh, at very at first his uh, steamships right and kind of naval canal trade eventually he got into railroads uh, Mr. Um, Andrew Carnegie uh, the next one on the right uh, he was very famous for his production of steel and we're going to be getting into some of his works and so uh, as you can imagine a nation poised to uh, just on the precipice of building up all of your cities and railroads and factories and bridges, all of them needing steel. The fact that you are now the number one producer of steel, right? Money. Um, next up on the right hand side, JP Morgan. Does anybody have a Chase bank account? A JP Morgan Chase bank account. He was in banking and finance, and boy, oh boy, was he. Uh, growing his wealth. Last but not least, on the right hand side, we have more of the uh, entrepreneur slash uh, middle class man, Henry Ford, which revolutionized the automobile industry with his uh, various practices on the assembly line um, and was arguably the uh, catalyst and introduction for automobiles being as widespread as they are today. Now, let us speak of the second industrial revolution. Um, this industrial revolution was the second, uh, second most. The first one we cover in early U.S. history towards the tail end um, because it developed in Britain and made its way towards the shores of the United States. However, now that we are getting into the late 1800s uh, slash you know, early 1900s, we are clearly in the second industrial revolution. Now, uh, the second industrial revolution uh, is different than the first in mainly in terms of scale. The first industrial revolution uh, that began in Britain, um, they just started to uh, experiment with coal and build factories and have early forms of machinery. Uh, and so they slowly, and from the first industrial revolution, uh, moved from textile industries or making things with their hands, slowly moving towards a more mechanized economy and mechanized lifestyle. The second industrial revolution uh, took that form and catapulted it even further. And so now we are truly having large scale factories, large scale mechanization um, and promoting these kind of industrial goods. And so the United States during this uh, time period had a giant leap in industrial output. Um, some factors that were helping along this uh, train of thought. Uh, the U.S. in conjunction with uh, westward expansion and that mindset, right, that uh, once again from the last chapter, that it is our God-given right to expand westward and use what God has given us. And so amongst that train of thought, we will use the natural resources that God has blessed us onto this earth, onto this land, and use it for our own benefit. And so they are using as much resources as humanly possible without considering, um, you know, conservation of nature. Uh, they are growing the supply of labor. Once again, we viewed this from our last couple of chapters, especially from the westward expansion uh, phase, that immigration in the U.S. is still at a very healthy pace. If, if anything, it is increasing year by year. And so every single year, we're getting hundreds of thousands and millions of people coming into the United States. So that is a always a fresh 
influx of labor and expanding markets for goods both internally and externally right domestically and internationally uh, and we also have and see government intervention so the government and various presidents and congress themselves uh, they end up enacting various legislation um, to help promote uh, our own industries in the United States and protect them from foreign competitors, such as making high tariffs. A tariff is essentially an additional tax. So if you want to import goods from internationally, you must pay a tariff, an additional tax. However, if you, let's say, buy uh, domestically, let's say the tariff would not be there, um, or you would or it would be much cheaper for you to do so. So those are some of the things that government can do to sway consumer um, purchases, right? Uh, once the railroads were expanding uh, westward, they began to uh, essentially just give land away for cheap and or free sometimes to the, la uh, to the railroad companies because it would behoove the U.S. government to allow the railroad companies to expand to their greatest, utmost extent because this would also benefit the United States to grow in a much uh, quicker pace, right? Uh, and many times the government also gave land to farmers, miners. Uh, last time in last chapter for westward expansion, we were looking at the Homestead Act, right, of 1862, which was giving upwards of 160 acres of land to um, anyone who qualified and pretty much just showed up and built a fence. So uh, the government definitely had some policies, right, that were expediting all of this. By 1913, just right before World War I, the United States was producing one third of the world's industrial output. Now, it's crazy to think that 100 plus years later, uh, that the United States is no longer going to be this a large producer of the world's, uh, you know, goods. That role has now shifted mainly to other countries, China, India, um, a host of these uh, Southeast Asian uh, countries. Uh, and so the United States has, within 100 plus years, converted itself from being the world's industrial outputter to being now a consumer economy. And we'll get into the consumer-based uh uh, economic stuff uh, pretty soon and so they produce more than Great Britain France and Germany combined uh, and so you know at this point in time we have to keep things in context this is 1913 right before World War one really uh, blasted off and at this point in time the United States is still uh, sort of the newcomer to the world stage the European powers for centuries, not decades, centuries right now, have been the superpowers of the world, expanding, colonizing around the world, spreading their uh, culture and religion, right, to the farthest reaches um, that their empires could stretch. And so the United States, early on from the American Revolution, right, kind of surprised the world with a successful revolution against the mighty British Empire, as time went on, uh, they began to grow and grow over the 1800s. So towards the later end of the 1800s, uh, they were definitely being more respected on the world stage, but they were still not the big players, right, as far as the world events, um, you know, were concerned. Uh, but the fact that they were producing so much was definitely putting them up on the kind of echelon of sort of top powers, if you will. And so as we're going through the second industrial revolution, um, another major transition that we had that is different from the first industrial revolution is that now our agricultural farming society that Thomas Jefferson and other original founding fathers loved and thought that it was the bread and basket of the American ideal and democracy all of that is now being shifted towards a an industrial society what does that mean what is the difference uh, an agricultural farming society is one where the majority of the population of a nation would be farmers right they would be living on farms and they would be producing some type of agricultural output however 
migrating into an industrial society means that we now have these large cities being built around the nation and that people are migrating to these cities for work, mostly and usually, right, work in factories. And so this is an enormous shift because now we are seeing people going from land owning independent farmers towards becoming working class employees for companies, corporations, businesses, mining operations, what have you. And so the entire mantra or mentality within America started to shift and change. So instead of, let's say, you owning, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, whatever acres of land, or maybe 160 plus acres, depending if you had that Homestead Act available to you, uh, you owning all of that land and being proud of the work that you do, you're toiling the land with your own hands, maybe hiring a few other farm hands, right? But it is your land, you are a proud owner. Now you're moving into a, a very cramped, dirty city, usually, and you're getting paid minimum wage, right, to work in these factories, but you're living in the big city. So things definitely started to change culturally, socially, and um, economically. And so this, during this time, we see this massive migration to the cities. From 1870 to 1920, over a 50-year period of time, we see approximately 11 million moving from the farms to the city. And in addition to that, an extra 25 million or so immigrants arriving on the coastal cities. So if you could imagine these large cities on the coast of America, they are just being bombarded with population, right? And so this allows for the cities to grow expansively, right? And be, become these large metropolitan cities. However, there is a detrimental cost to that in terms of overpopulation, dirt, disease, filth, etc. Let's look at uh, the railroads under Mr. Vanderbilt, the first of our uh, large kind of robber barons. So the railroads, Mr. Cornelius Vanderbilt, he was a businessman who built his wealth on railroads and shipping. Initially, most of his business was uh, having shipping alongside canals and rivers, right? He would be the guy who owns all of the boats and would help you transport all of your goods and services. However, later on, he started to migrate towards the railroad industry because he saw the lay of the land. He saw that the railroads are going to explode as a business and industry. And so especially with all of the increased flow of immigration and people in the United States, he, kn he knew that transportation would be the key element for these people getting around. And so you might as well be there to profit from it. And so he started to create this large railroad network, uh, you know, throughout the US and building and uh, inputting all of this rail uh, into the ground. And so to do so, he cannot, f you know, fund all of that himself, it's very costly. And so he started to ask local state and federal governments for loans in which he was getting millions upon millions. And in addition, he wanted the rights and grants to those lands so that you can own the land of all of the uh, railroads that you are building across the US, right? Because you can't just simply just build railroads through whoever's land, you need to get, you know, uh, rights for it. And so this is where the term robber barons ended up uh, becoming a thing and forming. So the farmers, the people who own the land throughout the US, and some of that land, right, because the railroad is cutting through them, they started to refer to these individuals as robber barons, because they were robbing them, they were stealing the land, right, as far as the farmers were concerned. So that is how the name was created. That is how the name eventually stuck. So from 1860 to 1880, we see that the mileage of railroads tripled. And then once again, from 1880 to 1920, it tripled again. So as you can see, it is an explosive amount of rail. Uh, at the end of the Civil War, we had around 35,000 miles of railroad. By the 1900s, the early 1900s, we had almost 200,000 miles of railroad, uh, an enormous, you know, continuation. Uh, one advantage that we also got from the railroads was time zones. Uh, today, we live in an era where Pacific, era, Pacific time, Eastern time, Central time, right? That's a normal thing for us. However, 
Um, that was not the case back in the day. Um, if you were traveling, everyone just kind of had the local time. And that's it. Uh, but the fact that the railroads needed to have a precise measurement of time for their tickets and to know when the trains are going to arrive because of the railroads, they actually were, uh, cr they created the time zones, right? And that the United States ended up adopting it into the modern day. And we still use this today. Um, and then some national branding was created here as well. And so because of all of this interconnectivity, between the east, the west, the north, the south, and all of the US in general because of these railroads and making transportation that much faster. Companies are now able to uh, market themselves and to sell their goods across the nation. So instead of you just having a local shop and store in, let's say, New York State, and just the New Yorkers know about you and your produce and your product, uh, now, because of railroads, you could possibly ship all the way to Florida. You could ship to Texas, right? All of these things are opening up to you. So we start to get the rise of national brands as well. If you have the time, please look at this video of Vanderbilt's life and business. Um, it is a great look at how he got started in the uh, shipping industry and the rivers and the canals and how he slowly migrated towards the building of the railroads. Unfortunately, towards the end of his life, uh, his railroad dream was cut short because he essentially was bankrupted by some of his competitors because this is a ruthless business uh, once you get into the high levels of wealth. And so at the very end of his life, he ended up uh, being poor, destitute, and died shortly after. Um, and so his um, friend and mentee, which was Andrew Carnegie, um, he, it broke his heart to see Vanderbilt um, at the end of his days and at the end of his luck um, in that circumstance. But here is Mr. Vanderbilt, uh, definitely, uh, you know, one of the, I guess, founding fathers of the Second Industrial Revolution, right? If you want to coin it um, as such. Here's a wonderful, uh, <laughs> here's a wonderful sort of like a cartoon uh, uh, magazine cover, right? And so it sees Vanderbilt on the left-hand side, riding two trains. And then on the right-hand side, right, we have Erie Railroad. Let him rip, Commodore, but don't stop to water or you'll be beat. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a fun, friendly competition, uh, essentially amongst the railroads. And so Vanderbilt was attempting to grow and expand his railroad empire. And so he had his railroads, but then he would try to buy out other competing railroads. So you are going to become the one big railroad company um, in the U.S. But some railroads, such as Erie Railroad Company, um, did not want to sell to them. Funny enough, all of this uh, animation and caricatures, right, um, just remind me of the Monopoly game, right? Buying the railroads. Doesn't give you too much money, but still helps. Uh, this is an interesting one. So we saw this photo before during Manifest Destiny, I believe, in the last chapter. Uh, and so as these railroads are being built, some of the railroads, um, there was two uh, coming from the west. Because most of all of the cities and everything that we had was on the east coast. And they were pushing westward, hence westward expansion. However, one of the railroads uh, was actually created in uh, San Francisco, right? On the west coast and they started to build inland because the goal was to have a connected railroad from east to west because the first company that could do such a thing would make vast amounts of profits because everybody would be using your railroad to gun towards the west and so finally once they started to make the inter uh, the intercontinental railroad uh, they finally met and had champagne and it was a huge celebration and they ended up uh, hammering a golden spike uh, as a celebratory kind of measure into the ground. Uh, now, if any uh, intelligent, astute person was there at that ceremony at that day, they probably would have waited till 4 a.m. and then dug up that gold uh, you know, nail uh, and come back home to their significant other and be like, honey, that's it, right? <laughs> We've struck it rich. Let's go to the Caribbean. Here's a wonderful photo of the railroads crisscrossing through some of the territory in the southwest. 
uh, definitely right building and advancing as much as possible. And so the railroads were uh, seen as the artery and veins, right, and the life bloodline of America and and westward expansion at that. Oh, this sad to say, the railroads were also connected um, in in uh, in inhumane way towards the buffaloes. Uh, last time we were discussing the uh, eradication and genocide and uh, f- you know warfare against Native Americans by all of the settlers and white po- uh, populace. The railroads expediated the death of the buffaloes because people, whether settlers by themselves or whether from the U.S. Army as specific mandates, they started to kill off the buffalo because they understood that the Native American tribes in the Great Plain region, were living off of the buffaloes and they were part of their lifestyle, their food, their economy, their everything. And so they started to kill them en masse just for the sport of it, just to start to dwindle their numbers. And this photograph is an enormous pile of skulls of buffalo. Just to give you a perspective, right, on some of this. And the railroads were uh, aiding in this because they sped up the travel they sped up the progression of all of these settlers and so uh, a lot of times people even on the railroads themselves as they were traveling let's say if you're on the railroad and you're sitting there and you're enjoying your travels and then you see you know this massive buffalo herd on the left or right hand side you would just take out your guns and start to shoot some of them for sport um, and just you just leave them dead uh, and so Unfortunately, the buffalo population was devastated all the way up to almost extinction. However, in recent years, they have slowly been increasing their numbers. Andrew Carnegie, the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, Andrew Carnegie is a second of our robber barons that we were going to look over and perhaps one of the most famous. Uh, He has an amazing story. And I believe um, I spoke of this last time, but we'll get into a little more detail today. So Andrew Carnegie was born in Scotland uh, in the UK in 1835 during the textile industries. His family were weavers, uh, weavers meaning that they were, uh, you know, sewing everything by hand. Um, And so, you know, the textile industry was still the old school way for centuries for people to... uh, weave everything and make things by hand make your own products by hand however on the onset of all of this uh, industry and factories growing in uh, the uk uh, they were run out of business they didn't need them anymore because a textile industry a successful one let's say in the 1700s or before let's say if your very successful textile industry is employing one or two hundred employees right everyone is working with their hands and making the goods and you're very productive and then all of this new machinery comes about and the machinery alone on a daily basis can do the work of 50 people and you barely have to pay anything for it right it's much cheaper for you to keep the machine than the people uh so what they would end up doing is buying two three four five whatever different machines and instead of one or two hundred employees you probably just have like 10, 20, just to oversee the machines. And so the entire industry started to shift from hiring individuals to create all of these, all of these goods towards hiring low income or low wage earners to just oversee the machines, right? They no longer even had to have any knowledge or skill of how to make things by hand. Eventually they just taught any a person that walked through the doors and wanted cheap, fast pay. This is how you handle the machine. If it clogs, this is how you fix it. And that's it. Let the machine do the work. Uh, And so the entire industry, right, and the business models started to change. But Andrew Carnegie's family, because now they were unemployed and they were facing poverty, uh, dire poverty at that, his family ended up emigrating to the United States for a better life. Uh, it is interesting because there is various uh, videos and writings 
well, there's various videos we can watch on it, but there's there's like writings on uh, Andrew Carnegie speaking about his family. Um, and then on more than one occasion, he writes in his bi uh, biographies that his mother, all throughout his childhood to her dying day, kept cursing his father because his father failed at being a man. His father failed to provide for them financially. Um, and so growing up, Andrew Carnegie would always keep hearing, essentially, your father is a nobody, your father is a loser, etc. And so that I'm supposing drove some of his um, early intellectual development and ambition towards understanding that money for him in this day and age was paramount. And so once they got to the United States, they hit the East Coast and they, you know, started to all work. And during this day and age, there's nothing with there's nothing close to child labor laws. If you're 12, 13, 14, you're going to start working if your family needs the money. Um, and so he ends up going to work and becoming essentially an errand boy, right? A kind of PA, I guess, um, for the railroad companies under Vanderbilt, right? And others. And so he is very quick on his feet, very successful. Uh, he ends up, you know, rising through the ranks. And he was one of the only people at that time that could that learned how to hear morse code so instead of morse code people needing to um <laughs> have some type of uh you know sheet in front of them right to remember what everything means he was just doing a freestyle uh and so they ended up seeing all of this kind of ingenuity and genius and all this fire in his belly and so they started to promote him even faster uh and so he started to get promoted faster and faster and saved up enough money to buy his first steel mill. After he bought his first steel mill, he ended up buying a second, a third, a fourth, um, and started to grow his steel empire. Now, one of the interesting things is that he it was a, an enormous bet at that point in time, steel, because most bridges and railroads, they were still using iron. Iron is different from steel in a few ways. So they're essentially the same, but steel requires additional processing to strip out the additional carbon from the iron, hence making it even more uh, rigid and strong, but also flexible at the same time. So steel is more flexible and much stronger um, and does not rust as easy. And so steel at the time was extremely expensive to make. And so as he was starting his early career in businesses, it was very slow. But once he started to prove to people that, listen, steel can be made for bridges, steel can be used on railroad tracks, and steel also can be used for all of your buildings in the cities um, to make all of these wonderful skyscrapers that were not possible using iron. They could not hold up that enormous amount of weight, but steel beams could. So him over time, uh, t advocating to people, right, and selling his steel business uh, started to really, um, you know, uh, you know, snowball. And so by the end of his life, he owned pretty much all of the steel industry in the United States. Um, and towards the very end, JP Morgan ends up offering to buy out his steel company, which was the most successful company in the world of steel at the time. Uh, and surprisingly, he said yes. And so the story goes that J.P. Morgan wrote down on a piece of paper a number, handed it to him, and he said, I agree. Uh, and so it was to the cool sum of, I believe, 420 or $440 million, um, not adjusted for inflation. So if you adjust that for inflation in today's days, that's God knows how many billions of dollars. So overnight, he became the richest man in the world. Uh, interestingly, though, as this quote at the bottom says, the man who dies rich dies disgraced. He understood and believed that in the first half of somebody's life, they should be earning money and making money. The second half of their life, they should be giving it away. And so he was the first person publicly and in all of his biographical works to uh, state and commit the majority of his wealth, the vast majority, if not all of his wealth, to charities. Um, and donating into uh, building schools and libraries and all of these um, public works. 
and so he famously started that tradition and others such as in the modern day like Bill Gates um, and a few other billionaires have also promised to give the majority of their wealth to uh, charity upon their death. Now, this is a wonderful video detailing Carnegie's life uh, and having some historians and authors here uh, comment and critique on it. So if you want uh, to watch this uh, video, please do so. It gives you a wonderful encapsulation of Carnegie and his uh, life. Uh, here's some uh, a, a sketch of Carnegie's steelworks in Ohio. Um, some of the kind of early form steelworks and plants that they had. But as they were getting bigger and larger and more advanced, uh, we start see seeing these large, uh, you know, these large sort of uh, industrial pots, right? Kind of with all of the melting ore uh, in them that you have to heat up to extreme degrees. And so the working conditions here were very difficult, right? Um, breathing in a lot of the dust and a lot of the fumes. Um, you know, heating things up and just having temperatures go up to 100 or 120 degrees, right? You're just glistening and sweat as you're working. Uh, so very difficult jobs. However, uh, steel ended up building the majority of the U.S. at this time. It was the lifeblood of the United States. And these steel mills were uh, some of the most productive in the world. And so Carnegie and his steel uh, works uh, ended up developing and growing a reputation around the United States and the world as being this industrial might, right, to grow entire uh, cities. Uh, so definitely a good bet on Carnegie as he uh, started, you know, to develop his business. And uh, he wrote some various uh, works himself, one of them being the Gospel of Wealth, that... Uh, he had a very interesting take. Whereas other big business moguls were so wealthy at the time that they pretty much just kept the wealth to themselves, right? And gave it to their children. But Andrew Carnegie saw that just giving and handing out all of the wealth to your children uh, was going to ruin and spoil them rotten. And he started to think about the role that he had in what kind of responsibility does such a wealthy mogul have towards himself, his family, and his community slash nation at large. And so he wrote the Gospel of Wealth because he was trying to find a proper use for his vast wealth. And so he says here, Poor and restricted are our opportunities in this life. Narrow our horizon. Our best work most imperfect. But rich men should be thankful for one inestimable boon. They have it in their power during their lives to busy themselves in organizing benefactions, from which the masses of their fellows will derive lasting advantage and thus dignify their own lives. So essentially he's saying here, rich, rich individuals should be thankful for their prosperity. And they should consider... Uh, that the masses have given them this beautiful advantage. And so, you know, they must dignify their own lives by doing the following. Second half of the quote. This then is held to be the duty of the man of wealth. First, to set an example of modest, unostentatious living, shunning display or extravagance, or uh, to provide moderately for the legitimate wants of those dependent upon him, and after doing so, to consider all surplus revenues which come to him simply as trust funds, which he is called upon to administer, and strictly bound as a matter of duty to administer in the manner which, in his judgment, is best calculated to produce the most beneficial results for the community. The man of wealth thus becoming the mere agent and trustee for his poorer brethren, bringing to their service his superior wisdom, experience and ability to administer doing for them better than they would or could do for themselves so essentially that second half of the quote says do not spend your wealth on all of these lavish ostentatious things do not go and buy a yacht do not go buy a mansion uh, instead use all of this god-given prosperity and wealth that you have attained to the benefit of others to the benefit of those who cannot do for themselves to the poorer 
countrymen that you have. And so this is a completely radical idea on extreme wealth at this moment in time, in this day and age, which Carnegie definitely was on the forefront of this kind of train of uh, thinking. And then you can read this, um, uh, this as well. And so this is part two of his Gospel of Wealth. Uh, in essence, him saying, bestowing charity um, and aiding others, right, is the true joy of life. And that if you are going to, um, uh, you know, really want to do some good in the world, you have to, uh, you know, give to others. It is not only rewarding to uh, buy stuff for yourself, but it is more rewarding to actually uplift others, right? And see the smile on their face and help them help themselves. Now that we have covered steel, let us cover oil for all of you driving on the roads. Um, oil in the modern day, it is definitely the key, uh, one of the key ingredients of our modern civilization. And sooner or later, oil is going to run out. And then it'll be interesting to see how the US and the world transition from a life of oil based uh, economics to a life of post oil based economics. But in this day and age, for the Gilded Age, John D. Rockefeller was the uh, robber baron, right? The, the huge mogul for oil. So he was a businessman and a philanthropist and is considered one of the wealthiest Americans of all time and one of the richest. Uh, he was born into a large uh, family in New York, uh, but to modest means. He was helping his mother do chores, earning extra money around the farm and the house. Uh, and so over time, he learned from his studies that there was a colonel, Edwin Drake, who struck black gold in Pennsylvania. And so that was the name of oil, black gold, because it was so rich and could make you extremely wealthy because of the enormous amount of properties that oil uh, created. So essentially, during this uh, day and age, uh, they were starting to develop the means of what does oil do? How can we convert oil into fuel? And they found out that oil, and it's still true today, that oil has one of the largest um, ratios of return, right, in regards to energy. If you burn X amount of oil, it gives you, I forgot what the number is, like 13 times the energy, right, that you put into it, which is an enormous amount that we still have not yet uh, been able to replicate as well. So oil truly is that golden nugget of a substance. And if you can sell it, you'll, you will make literal gold. Um, and so he initially worked with a few of his friends, but in 1870, he tried to venture off onto his own and created the Standard Oil Company, initially valued at $1 million. Now, over the course of his lifetime, it was eventually probably uh, valued in the hundreds of millions. Um, but John D. Rockefeller is a perfect example of what we call the creation of a monopoly. And no, not monopoly the game, monopoly the economic... Uh, the economic... Uh, term for buying up all of your competition. So a monopoly is essentially once you create a business, let's say on your street, if you buy out all of your competition, and you are the only business that can provide that good or service, you now have a monopoly on the market, you are the only uh, business that is able to provide that good or service. So eventually you could just raise the prices or do whatever it is that you want. And so in the modern day and context today, we are definitely starting to see some other monopolies starting to grow or develop. Uh, Amazon is probably the largest target in terms of monopoly because more and more people are going to Amazon for their online purchasing. And they've just become this huge megalith, right, of online business and consumerism. And so mom and pop stores are shutting down nationwide. And so many are critiquing and saying that Amazon is a monopoly and that they should be broken up because they've gotten too large for their own good. Um, however, we will see as time goes on whether uh, the U.S. Congress wants to attack such large businesses and truly say that they are um, 
doing a disservice right to the nation here's mr rockefeller um, on the left hand side in his early days just starting off standard oil just kind of you know uh, beginning his entire uh endeavor and on the right hand side um you know him towards the later end uh, signing whatever paperwork he needs to sign on a daily basis right probably a very busy individual and so let's uh, discuss uh, trusts and business competition a little bit so with all of this economic boom and prosperity going throughout the world there was a few legal codes that were governing business affairs but for the most part laws did not catch up initially so if you want to consider it this way, as the second industrial revolution is truly advancing, as all of these businesses and moguls and companies are making ludicrous amounts of money and power and influence, the legality of the nation, the legal system has not caught up. And so many things that they were doing, which in today's day and age would be considered illegal, back then, it was free game, right? It was open season. And so we have the creation of trusts. Legal devices used by rival companies where they were managed by a single director. What does this mean? This means that a bunch of these different companies would get, uh, get together and discuss business and say, listen, uh, let's say in January and February, um, it'll be your month to charge extra, right? And kind of have all these goods and services and for you to suck up some of the business and the money from the people. The next two months, you back off a little bit, we'll give all the money and business to these individuals, right? And so they were kind of playing the market and manipulating the market for their own benefit. So that's something you cannot do today, but in this day and age, once again, if the law does not state anything, you know, open season. Uh, and so we started eventually to get what was known as the economic mafia. They, because they began to coordinate all of their different companies in order to best scheme against the people of the United States, against the consumers of how to best make money. And they were named the big three. Carnegie Steel, J.P. Morgan Investing, and Rockefeller Oil. They were the big players of the day and age and the largest um, I guess today's big three would be, if I had to consider off the top of my head, uh, Apple, Amazon, mm, and either Microsoft or Tesla, I think. I'm not sure which. Or maybe we should replace that with one of the oil companies because big oil is still uh, a viable business. But either way, right? The, these large, huge companies and corporations... Ah, this is an interesting slide. Very important slide. So make sure to write good notes on this one. We will be discussing vertical versus horizontal integration and actually defining robber barons and what does it all mean. So vertical integration uh, means that you had some companies like Andrew Carnegie Steel that were buying up different processes to pretty much ensure that from A to Z, the product that they were making was completely and utterly under their control. And so from Carnegie's perspective, he ended up buying out the actual uh, land and the mines that the iron ore would be located in. He ended up buying out the transportation, manufacturing, and distribution of all of this that would end up leading his steel into the hands of its consumers. And so, essentially, he got rid of all of the middlemen in business. He said, I will literally control every aspect of the product. And so that's why they call it vertical, vertical integration, because literally from the ground, from the earth, you control from the raw materials all the way up towards the distribution towards the consumer. So in a very kind of vertical manner. And so the perfect example of this was Ar Andrew Carnegie, because he was uh, he, he was controlling every facet of the steel production. Modernly, we can make the same comparison and say that Apple 
is integrating vertical integration because they have very uh, good stringent controls on their phones, right? And their tech because the iOS they control, the chips and the internal of the phone they control and the phone themselves. They are in complete control of the entire process of making one of these phones versus let's say an Android phone where they, um, let's say if uh, you know all these different companies they're bringing in random you know kind of android software but it's not their home proprietary blend of a software apple controls every facet of it now let's look at horizontal integration horizontal integration was used like we described with john d rockefeller so horizontal integration says that when you are in business of whatever particular type you buy out all of the competition within that marketplace. And so John D. Rockefeller ended up buying all of the other oil refineries in the U.S. that he could find. And at a certain point, he controlled 90% of the U.S. oil. Now, once he got to that point of owning 90% of the United States oil industry, later on, we started getting the U.S. government finally being wise and privy to all of this and creating laws to prevent them, such as the Sherman Antitrust Act. And so they ended up busting these trusts and busting these large companies. And so eventually Standard Oil was disintegrated into smaller oil companies because they were too big, right? He owned too much power and influence. And so here we get the official definition of robber barons. Incredibly wealthy tycoons who wielded power within their own company and industry without any accountability within an unregulated marketplace. And so the main three things here, they owned an enormous amount of power. They had no accountability. They just did what they want. And unregulated marketplace because U.S. Congress at that point in time had did not have the laws necessary to reel them in right it, they were just doing whatever they could to make income and money and in 1894 we get this wonderful piece of critique called wealth against commonwealth by henry lloyd and he was discussing rockefeller's unfair economic competition and him manipulating the market by bribing legislatures so essentially, he was seeing the early forms of lobbying in this country where Rockefeller and others were using their money to essentially bribe U.S. legislatures. And so we still see this happening and occurring today in its various forms. Uh, and, you know, history, although sometimes it does not repeat itself from Mark Twain's famous quote, history definitely rhymes. Uh, it has rhyming beats throughout history and we see here early on that they are pouring money into congress and i'm pretty sure nobody today would dispute the fact that congress has become a bit corrupted right um in all of the financial dealings with companies and institutions uh here we have a beautiful uh sort of uh, visual representation and picture uh a kind of magazine uh you know drawing description of standard oil and making it look like this large you know octopus like you know a monster that has its tentacles wrapped around congress has its tentacles wrapped around um, other uh, legislatures on the bottom right with their papers in their hands and the tentacle is slowly trying to go in and wrap itself around the white house the executive branch um, and so, you know, at this point in time, yeah, Standard Oil, because they did own 90% of the oil production in the U.S., they it definitely exerted an obscene amount of control against anyone that they wanted to go up against. Now, let's discuss uh, another invention under Alexander Graham Bell, the telephone. Boom. So he was also a Scottish-born uh, American inventor and so he was credited with inventing and patenting the first practical telephone he also co-founded the American Telephone and Telegraph Company do you notice the acronym 
American Telephone and Telephone Company, AT&T. This is the early onset of AT&T, folks. And so within 20 years of the first cable lines being laid, uh, Western Union controlled 80% of the country's telegraph lines, operating nearly 200,000 miles of telegraph routes. So the telephone really started to branch off into its own, obviously, because it was the fastest form of communication. No longer did you need to write a letter and hope for a response within a couple weeks. You could just call the person up and get an immediate response. So much faster. Now, let's see. So, the patent for the telephone. So, although the telephone was initially patented by Alexander Bell in 1876, he was not the first one to invent and actually conceptualize it, but he was the first one to truly capitalize. Western Union would later commission Thomas Edison to invent a more improved version of the telephone because the first versions were a little large and clunky, but the more refined versions, the truly kind of usable ones they could use in your homes, uh, were uh, used later on and invented by Thomas Edison. So fearing a lawsuit from Bell, they sold Edison's idea to the Bell Company. And so Bell Company ultimately became right AT&T um, and had the wonderful new uh, invented improved version of the telephone that was attributed to Edison. Uh, and so here's Alexander Bell on the left hand side um, having that first conceptual ideas and then the telephones over time were able to get more and more refined um, and usable um, and so to the point of you know is just trial and error right trying to use as much as possible um, as many uh, inventions as possible to see what the correct ratio of the telephones would be and especially trying to make it as usable as possible so that eventually you could put them in every home every bar every saloon every governmental building and so you would have all of these various kind of early form telephones here arguably in our day and age everyone or most most of you in your age range and demographic probably don't use telephones as often um, now it's all texting and sms and emojis um, so every generation it seems has their form of communication now edison and electricity arguably the single most important innovation in the last couple hundred years the single most the invention of electricity because if we did not have electricity all of our discussions of phones the internet computers all of it would be absolutely rubbish right and would not exist so the fact that you, are, that you are watching this video right now on your laptop or tablet or iPad or whatever uh, is a testament to Thomas Edison. So if anything, uh, as a modern society, my personal opinion is we should probably have a holiday called Edison Day because he brought us, right, <laughs> the electricity. Uh, but he spent so much time developing all of his various gadgets, um, you know, to explore electrical power uh, and eventually all of his electrical power uh, you know research would be used in mass communication sound recording motion pictures all of you movie lovers out there he famously said that he hoped to have a minor invention every 10 days and a big thing every month or so he had over 1,000 registered patents over his lifetime, which is an, a crazy amount. He was a, a, an inventor extraordinaire. Uh, some other notable inventions that he made. The phonograph, the mimeograph machine, motion picture projector, right, for the movies, dictaphone, and a storage battery that could store electrical power. So once again, all of our battery power that we have today would not exist without all of this early form tech. He uh, also invented the light bulb in 1879. He explored over 6,000 materials uh, to get that perfect combination and solution to make the light bulb. Um, 
so it you know he's a perfect example of if it doesn't work once or twice try uh a few thousand more times and you'll eventually get there uh he also used direct current called dc power but this dc power or essentially just like the power lines right they were transporting electrical current uh, was only limited to two miles or so. It's a very short range. So that's not great in terms of talking about like massive cities, right? Because you need electricity to flow to other parts of the city. So George Westinghouse comes into the picture. He was an engineer who invented alternating current or AC power, which could travel far greater distances. So essentially the way DC power works is DC power is in a very flat line, but that flat line does not travel far. AC currents they started to make was traveling in waves like this and it traveled an extremely far away. And so from all this combination tech, right, this is the early on forms of what life is like today and will be absolutely different um, if right these individuals did not invent what they had invented. Um, so definitely a very interesting thing to see and study. Here's the that famous AC machine by Westinghouse, um, creating essentially the opportunity and possibility for us to uh, have electricity go into long distances, right, and create these big metropolitan cities. Eventually, having, as we see here, Westinghouse Electronics, uh, you know, these large factories that were just powerhouses, literally powerhouses, that would transfer electricity to the rest of the city. Now, let's discuss a little bit of um, class politics. Because as you could imagine, as these various individuals are getting wealthy above and beyond anything that anyone could have ever predicted, there is an inevitably going to be an accumulation of power and money in the hands of a few and the rest having less and less access to resources. So essentially the uneven distribution of wealth, something we are critically seeing today, uh, you know, on mass worse or on par to what was going on in the Gilded Age. I believe personally right now we are in the second Gilded Age or whatever the equivalent would be. So by 1890, the richest 1% of Americans controlled the same income as the bottom half of the population and owned more property than the other 99%. Sounds very, very similar to the modern day, folks. Um, and because all of this income inequality was uh, getting worse and worse, we start to get the theory of the leisure class on the precipice of the turn of the century by historian Thornstein Veblen. And he published that the upper class lavish culture of buying all of these goods and dressing up, you know, in extravagant silks and having these cars and mansions and whatever, uh, focused on conspicuous consumption. What that means is that spending was not needed or even wanted, but they simply needed to spend the wealth to show and demonstrate to everybody that they had it right? It's a it's an amazing uh, thing to look at. And so examples of all of this lavish lifestyle building would be these big palatial homes and mansions that they were building, exclusive social clubs that you had to uh, pay the top dollar for, let's say like, I don't know, Equinox gym today, who has 300 something dollars or whatever, however much it costs to pay per month for Equinox, right? Um, schools, colleges, private balls, intermarrying within select amounts of families. So the entire class differentiating system between the haves and the have nots truly starts to become apparent here. Here we have um, a visual representation of the expansion of all of the uh, uh, railroads, right? And all of this... Uh, uh, migrations and this is a wonderful map so here visually to represent it in 1860 the the level of railroad development 
And then fast forward to 1870, we have the first intercontinental railroad, see, from 1860, then boom, 1870, intercontinental railroad. And then from 1870 to 1890, complete and utter railroad expansion. So things are really, really picking up, right? Life is truly picking up at this, uh, at this point. Ah, Gilded Age politics, since we're talking about money and politics and corruption. William Tweed, Boss Tweed, as he, as he was called. Uh, he was essentially the mafioso man of the day and age. Um, and we'll, we'll get to him in a second after we define what the Gilded Age was. So the Gilded Age, um, as we, this entire section is named Gilded Age. But instead of merely just giving the definition in the very beginning, it was prudent, I, I believe, to go through all of this history and to show how much money disparity we saw and how much technological innovation we saw to kind of put all this in, into perspective. So what was the Gilded Age? It was a title from a Mark Twain novel, The Gilded Age, meaning covering something in a layer of gold, but masking a deceivingly hollow and little value core. So if you gild something, you are covering it in gold and making it look beautiful. But it is deceiving because inside it could be rotten and hollow. And so the Gilded Age was essentially America and business, right? Looking beautiful and glamorous. But once you look in depth and inside, a lot of problems, right? With society and unevil, uneven distribution of resources uh, and more. Boss William Tweed. He was a Democratic Party political machine politician who had a lot of influence in New York. Uh, and I don't know how to feel about this guy. I'm honestly torn, even to this day and age. I've discussed this man on many different occasions, and I am honestly torn. Because on the one hand, he was stealing money from the government and charging all of these expensive building projects and, you know, charging like five, six, seven times what they should have cost. And that he was pocketing the difference. So, for instance, if he said uh, this bridge needs to be built for ten million dollars, it probably cost two million to build. So he kept eight million for himself. So he did this time and time and time again. And he stole anywhere from forty five to two hundred million dollars. We are not exactly sure how much he stole. But at the same time, even though he was sucking up the money, he was pretty benevolent in New York. He was helping people find jobs. He, uh, he as soon as, like, let's say many immigrants came to the uh, city and state of New York, uh, he would help you as an immigrant family settle in the right neighborhood, send your children to the right schools, um, find meaningful employment for you. Like, he would truly help you out. The only thing he would ask in return is, now that I've helped you out, when time comes, you vote for me. doesn't matter what it is. You vote for, with me. And so he would start to create these loyalty connections, right? Um, so eventually he was obviously caught and jailed for all those corruption charges. But uh, this shows how some of the Gilded Age politics worked. Very corrupt. Not a lot of laws in place. And in various instances, all of this uh, money being kind of tossed around and stolen, right, on the side. And so finally, we come towards the government. The slow government. That has been watching this transpire for years and did nothing. But now they are finally coming back into the fray. So we start off with a civil service exam which was a merit-based exam for all of these federal employees. So because of the Boss Tweed fiascos, they now wanted a better system for uh, their federal employees. So instead of you just rubbing elbows with somebody and saying, hey, this is my cousin, just get him in. That doesn't work anymore. They have official exams to test you out and see if you are good enough for this job that does have political influence. So at least it would... Uh, you know, filter out as many people as possible, right? That should probably not be there. Not a perfect system, but it helps. Uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission, 
they needed to regulate railroads even more. So the railroads started getting so powerful and so widely used that they started to uh, jack up the prices for farmers and merchants. But the U.S. government said, listen, farmers are critical for this country. They feed us. You will not raise the rates on them unreasonably. And so we start to see that one of the first instances of farmer protection here. And perhaps the most famous is the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890, a very important act to remember. So put it in your notes. This banned all combinations and practices that restrained free trade. Examples. Monopoly, vertical integration, horizontal integration, trusts, essentially everything we just discussed that all of these men did to gain enormous godlike wealth. It is now under the umbrella of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And they say that, no, all of this is illegal. Um, you are using the system, you know, and it is not it is not adher ad adhering to any kind of American ideals or democratic uh, market policies. Right. We have to regulate this. It's getting way out of hand. And so although some of these laws were a bit weak and general at first, it was at least a step in the right direction for the US government to finally say we have to at least intervene to a certain aspect. Yes, free market is always going to be there. Yes, people are always going to have their ultimate choice of how to, you know, have their business and how to make money. But we need to make sure that the game is still fair. We need to make sure that these individuals are not merely always just going to be the high up and wealthy. They have to play by the same rules. And so now that we have this enormous amount of wealth disparity, because we were talking about wealth inequality a little bit before, uh, we start to see social Darwinism flow. And so social Darwinism was used in socioeconomic as well as racial uh, prejudices and issues. But now, um, social Darwinism uh, was used in this particular context in a very economic way. And so social Darwinism is a theory, um, gaining the theories from Darwin himself, uh, that the evolution was a natural process in human society where some people are genetically superior and more intelligent than others, and thus they are better suited and deserve a better life. So they borrowed this from Darwin's original On the Origin of Species work on evolution. His very scientific and biological work when he was in Madagascar working with uh, and studying finches, he, Darwin himself, was making this evolutionary theory, right? Saying, oh, well, animals, they evolve over time depending on their location and the circumstances and the environment, etc. Right? A very nice, normal thing that we still use today as the foundation and basis of biological studies. But the social Darwinists were taking that and bastardizing that theory and saying, well, now we can say that various humans in society are more intelligent and thus deserve this wealth that they have gained. So this is a cover up for the extremely wealthy in the country, essentially saying that, listen, we acquired hundreds of millions of dollars of wealth and we did so because we are the inheritors of this superior mindset. We are genetically superior and we deserve to maintain this wealth. All of you poor people, sorry, you're just dumb and you deserve to stay there and you, you deserve to um, you know, be alive to better and enrich our lives. And so this social Darwinistic theory was um, propagated at the height of all of the social inequality and income um, inequality distribution. Uh, and, you know, some of it still exists today. If you see how some of the billionaires talk in terms of people, especially if they are downtrodden or poor or they cannot make it, um, they sometimes talk with some type of contempt um, at individuals today. Um, Congress and many um, economists and political theorists today are still going through the various conversations and issues of what kind of protections do we need for working class people? Should we have a standard minimum wage? Is it enough right now? Is it should be should it be increased? Should we tax these large corporations more? Uh, so these issues have not truly gone away. 
these issues are alive and well today. And if, if anything, they are even worse today because they're so much more complex with globalism and the crazily complicated tax codes that we have and technology making it you know even more complex to regulate so you know history definitely definitely rhymes and sometimes repeats itself now with that here's the end of chapter 18 the end of the gilded age i hope you liked it i hope you enjoyed this lecture um and you know let's not let's not kid ourselves that some of these issues are have definitely you know they, they definitely sound similar some of the gilded age policies that we just discussed and the income inequality still exist today and there are still very large issues to be had and in our day and age right in our lifetimes we are going to have to press the government uh, and lobby the government as much as possible to try to have them protect us because for the longest of times in my lifetime at least i have seen corporations and wealthy individuals buy the loyalty of all of these congressmen and women and so we definitely have to reverse the trend because uh this is a land of this is a land for everyone and so everyone deserves equal set of footing and an equal opportunity to succeed um and so if people gain wealth and they become wealthy i'm not opposed to that but i definitely want a fair playing field i don't want corporations paying minimal amounts of tax and then you know they're taking like 30 plus percent out of my paycheck that's not fair so yeah i want it to be more even but with that um i will end the lecture and i just want to thank every single one of you for being here for listening as always i will see you on the next one take care